How many of you guys have heard of the four spiritual laws? If you haven't, it's uh, an evangelism tract. I do have a picture that it's going to come up right here. It's an evangelism tract that Campus Crusade for Christ uses. Have you seen this before? Maybe I should come here. <laughs> the four spiritual laws. And I have a little bit of history with it growing up in a small Korean Presbyterian church. Our pastor had us go through it and use this tract for evangelism and all that. But if you open it up, the first law, the first statement that shows up is God loves you and offers a wonderful plan for your life. God loves you and offers a wonderful plan for your life. Now, how many of you believe that that is truly true in your life? That there is a wonderful plan that God created for you. He knits you in the mother's womb knowing your entire future. And he's a good father, and he didn't create you to have a mediocre life on this earth, a dull and boring life, and then you get to heaven, and now you live in joy. No, that's not the way our good father made it. He has an intricately woven plan for our lives. He has one that is made especially for you, for your fulfillment and for your enjoyment on this life. Now, I know that we find that fulfillment in Jesus Christ, in the, in the Trinity, in relationship and communion with him. That's first and foremost. But we also, I believe, find that fulfillment in what we're made to do on this earth. Which is why I think Jesus said in John 4, 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. He likens the work of God and accomplishing it, the will of God, to food that we eat. As in it is satiable, it fills you up. It's something that fills you up, yes. So God has that plan for our lives. But here's the main issue. We don't see that intricately woven plan for our lives when we're in the fire. When we're in pain, when we're in struggle, in the hard times, we become nearsighted. We become blind to all that God has for us, and we just focus on what's in front of us, that pain. And how many of you have been there? I have been there. And I want to talk about an individual in the Bible who struggled with this. He had the plan of God, but the pain and the process of God that he went through, it was, it took him to a place where he just lost hope. David. <laughs> David. We're going to talk about David. But I'll ask you the question first. How many, let me say that again. Have we allowed pain to take us off the right track? Have you been in that situation before? How do we get back on the right track? And then what, when life leaves you with no more strength left, takes everything away from you, how do you find strength again? These are the questions that David had to ask. And so today, what I'm going to do is flip this board over. Hopefully it's not empty. Hopefully I can get it flipped over. It's on the bottom. What would I do? Oh, no. I'm going to flip the entire thing around. That's what I'm going to do. Maybe, Leo, that's why you're here, to help me. <laughs> we can move it up a little bit here. Yeah. I planned that out wrong. <laughs> it's a little too complex for me. <laughs> but here, we're going to talk about two things today. Number one, an overview of David's life until he becomes king. And secondly, we're going to go deeper into our main passage. Okay? Our passage for today is 1 Samuel 30, 1 through 6. 
So if you have your Bibles, please turn to 1 Samuel 30, 1 through 6. At this moment, I can hear Pastor Ryan's voice. If he were here, he would say, 1 Samuel is before 2 Samuel. <laughs> you hear it as well, right? <laughs> yes, he would. 1 Samuel 30, 1 through 6. This is the word of God. Now when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, the Amalekites had made a raid against the Negev and against Ziklag. They had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire and taken captive the woman and all who were in it, both small and great. They killed no one, but carried them off and went their way. And when David and his men came to the city, they found it burned with fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. David's two wives also had been taken captive, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters. But, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Amen, amen. That passage was probably the hardest and most trying time before the big breakthrough in David's life. Now let's start at the beginning though. The beginning here, started off great for da David. And prophet Samuel comes to him in chapter 16, and he's anointed to be the next king. He's a young shepherd boy, and his brothers were not it. He was the one. And soon, he enters King Saul's service as an armor bearer. Well, first a musician. Remember, King Saul was having episodes. And David was there to appease him with the music. And then soon he found favor, and he was promoted, and he became the armor bearer for King Saul. Then David defeats Goliath when no one else dared to challenge him as a youth. Now, we don't know David's exact age, but we know that he was under 20. How do I know this? Numbers 1, 3, and other passages talk about the age of enlistment into the army, 20 and over. And David was not in the army yet. He was not a soldier. His brothers were, but he was bringing them bread. Remember that? So David was a youth, strong enough to defeat Goliath, but younger than 20. And in 18, Saul starts to send David because He's the most popular man in Israel. Everyone knows David's name. They're talking about him at the campfires in their tents. They talk about David, who de defeated Goliath. And in 18, David's being sent on missions. And he's finding success and favor. He's promoted over the men of war. So David is starting off great. And we're going to call this from 16 to 18. Oh. Season of victory. Can you read that? I'm sorry. I apologize in advance. You can probably tell that that's not my writing. <laughs> I started writing it off and my wife took over. But right here, we're going to call it from 16 to 18, the season of victory of David's life. He had, let me write this too, favor, promotion, and he had success in everything that he did. And it's the high before the low in the drama. Because in chapter 20, things take a turn. Jonathan warns David that Saul is going to kill you. And so David begins a life of exile. 
21, he flees to the cities of Nob and then to Gath. Nob was a city of priests. Gath was a city of the Philistines. He comes before King Achish. And do you remember what he did? They knew who he was. He acts, he, he acts crazy. And I just have to take a moment and tell you about a friend. <laughs> just because I want to tell it. This friend of mine, he was in Korea. And he was in the subway system. They have the metro. He was in a subway, and he pooped his pants. <laughs> and it wasn't just solid, it was liquidy diarrhea. I'm sorry if this is gross. And it was smelly. So what did he do? He started to act crazy. He started to drool out of his mouth. And that's exactly what David does here. He acts crazy so that no one would suspect him as being that David who defeated Goliath, who slayed tens of thousands of Philistines before the Philistine king. Okay? Chapter 22. I believe this left a mark in David. Saul kills all the priests except one in the city of Nob. And we'll see that David does blame himself for that. 25, he gets married. 22 through 26, we just see him fleeing from place to place. He came to the cave of Adullam, and he went from wilderness to city to stronghold. He's on the run. And it's probably tiring him out at this point. He's just so tired of running, so tired of this life of exile. And so here in chapter 27, we see a change. Uh, a, a milestone, or you can call it a chapter in his life where it turned for the worse. So in 27 through 30, this is our focus today. The area of focus. For one year and four months, David lives in Philistine territory. He says in his heart, I'm going to come to King Achish again. I'm going to live in his land in the land of the Philistines so that Saul won't chase me anymore. And this plan worked. But we'll see that David was not in the best state when he was here for this year and four months. And yeah, 30 is our focus today, where the Amalekites come and ransack Ziklag, their city. And finally, in chapter 31, King Saul dies in battle. And 2 Samuel 5, he becomes the king. So we're going to, I guess I'll label the first one first. From 20 through 30. We'll call this the season of death. And down at the bottom here, we'll call it the season of fulfillment. In this season of death, David had to go through humiliation. Guilt. Pain and loss. In chapter 30, it's probably the most trying time. So, we don't know his exact age here, but we do know one thing. He becomes king 
at the age of 30. Becomes king at the age of 30, reigns until he passes away at 70. 40 years he reigns. I'd like to think that around here, when he's being sent on missions, he's like 20 or a little less than that. That's what I think, but we don't know for sure. We do know then for a, maybe like 10 years, it could have been that he went through the season of death in his life. Now when we look at this entire picture, right, we start to see the way that God deals with you and me. Because right here is like David's yes. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to serve you. And we've made that commitment. But how many of us have gone through the season of death where our yes becomes tested through the fire? What season do you identify yourself in right now? You see, I think the season of death was difficult and painful, but it was a good season. It was a God season. Amen? This is where, for example, Psalm 63 was written. I told you David is running in the wilderness. And what does he say in Psalm 63? My soul faints. My, my flesh, it faints. It cries as in a dry and weary land. And he wouldn't have written that in the season of victory. See, here in the season of death, even though it was painful, this is where, this is where he learned desperation for God. This is where he learned to cry out to God alone. This is where he truly learned that God is his strong tower. He would become king here, and he would have all the riches of the world at his fingertips. But it was here. <laughs> it was here that he learned that the riches don't satisfy him. He learned to be satisfied in God alone. Amen? And I just look at this initial call as well. This is kind of like when someone lays their hands on you and tells you you're going to be a successful evangelist like Billy Graham. Or you'll impact the churches like Apostle Paul. You'll be a missionary like Reinhard Bonnke or Heidi Baker, you'll change Africa or Asia, you'll be a great prophet or revivalist business leader, you'll write a worship song or book that everyone will read. So that's like the initial call. But we can't take that and be like, I'm all that, right? Look at this entire process. We have to go through the season of death, amen? Amen. Now I want to ask the question, why was David here? Why was David here? Can we turn uh, in, in, in Philistine territory? Why was he there? Let's read 1 Samuel 27, verse 1 together. First Samuel 27, 1. Then David said in his heart, now I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me that I should escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will despair of seeking me any longer within the borders of Israel, and I shall escape out of his hand. Amen. So he said in his heart, if you just stop there already, we know that the heart is deceitful. In this case, David's heart is lying to him. And I want you to see what state David was in. In this one year and four months. So he was deceived in his heart. Number two, he was 
hopeless and apathetic about the plan of God for his life. Number three, he was physically, emotionally, spiritually tired. He didn't want to run anymore. Maybe number four, the only person who believes in him, Prophet Samuel, he's dead now. Maybe number five, he feels guilt and condemnation every time he sees Abiathar, the one priest that remained with him. In 1 Samuel 22, 22, David said this, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of your father's house. He's talking to Abiathar, the priest. So you see that he carried some sort of guilt and for this moment at Nob right here, where Saul kills the priest at Nob. Finally, in chapter 29, we see really what state David was in. Do you know the story here? In 29, David is now prepared to fight with the Philistines against the Israelites. This is so ironic in so many levels. He's known to be the one who defeated Goliath, the champion of the Philistine army. He's known to have slayed tens of thousands of them. They sung about him. But now he's siding with the Philistines to attack his brothers, his kinsmen. Do you see the irony of the situation and how David had lost his hope? He lost his hope in the plan that God had for him. And I just want to take a moment to ask you and me, have we become tired of fighting in any way? Where we've become apathetic or hopeless about the plan of God, the work that he has for us, the will of God? Do we deal with guilt or condemnation where it brings us down? Do we have no more strength to seek God? So let's recap. Now I'm going into the main scripture that we have for today. 1 Samuel 30, 1 through 6. Let's just recap. 27, he comes into Philistine territory. The king gives him Ziklag city. 29, he's ready to fight against Israel. Now 30, verses 1 through 3. I'm just going to tell the story. David and David's men are probably tired. They're rejected from fighting with the, because the Philistine lords didn't trust him. So they're headed back to their city, Ziklag, tired from the journey. And in the distance, they see smoke rising from their city. It's not a campfire, but it's a large fire. I'm sure even if, though they were tired, they ran towards that city to check their house, to check their families. And they found no possessions left. They found none of their family members left. They probably knew that it was the Amalekites. That's my hunch. Them being men of war. I feel like they knew. But what did they do? In verse 4, then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. And we're talking about death. We're talking about very difficult situations here that really suck the strength out of you. And what do you do in that situation, you know? Have you been in that situation before? Maybe it's the death of a family member. Maybe it's some immense financial burden that you've been carrying. Maybe the doctor told you that you have cancer or some incurable disease. Maybe it's a loss of relationship like a divorce. You know, the divorce rate is around 40 to 50%. And if I can share my story a little bit, because I've been there 
where my parents were divorced around the age of 10 or so for me. And I can just remember my mother just breaking down on the ground, crying until she had no more strength left. And then the decision that I had to make, whether to live with my mother or my dad, that was probably the most difficult decision I had to make in my life. And I did just, as a kid, I didn't know. I'm like, where is my dad? I'm just crying myself to sleep every day until I harden my heart. That's how I coped with it. And so when life leaves you with no more strength left like that, what do you do? There are two different responses that I see in our scripture today. One from David's men, and number two, from David. The first response we see from David's men, his bitterness and the blame game. Let's read that really quick. Verse six, and David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. David's men were bitter. They cried their eyes out for their sons and daughters. I don't know why they didn't cry for their wives. (laughs) But after they cried their eyes out, they all simultaneously looked to David, their leader. And they snarled. And they said, why did you bring us here? Why did you bring us to this land of the Philistines? Why are we not back in that cave or in that wilderness or stronghold? It's your fault, David. And they picked up their stones and they were ready to kill him. So the first response to pain in our lives here is bitterness that David's men had. Bitterness. What is bitterness? According to what I see here, the definition for bitterness is to blame another for the pain that you feel. To blame another for the pain that you feel. Have we become bitter in any way? Because of the pain in our lives, have we blamed another because of the pain in our lives? I do want to notice that leaders tend to get the blame. For example, employees to their bosses. I mean, you feel like your boss, you've been giving your best, but he or she is just so unfair to you, out to get you mistreats you, gives you the days that you don't want to work. <laughs> Why are you laughing? I'm just kidding. <laughs> and, or maybe you've been fired by an ex-boss. And so you blame your boss for the financial difficulty that you have for not growing in your career, and you become bitter. Or maybe wives to husbands. Your husband doesn't love you the way that you want to be loved. Your husband spends too much time out with his friends, out golfing, out at the gym, etc. And you feel that your husband doesn't prioritize you and the family. So you blame your husband for the state of your marriage and how you feel, and you become bitter. Or it happens also between sheep and shepherds. How you feel like your pastor just doesn't care about you or doesn't love you the way that you want to be loved. Maybe they say something to you and you become bitter. Here's an interesting one. Citizens to the government. How many times have we uh, blamed our government, our state, our president, our governor, And then we blame them for the pain that we feel as if they are God in our lives. 
Amen. For students to teachers, maybe you feel like your teacher picks on you. You get in trouble. You don't get the grades that you want to get on an essay, which you basically wrote the same thing as your friend, but you get the bad grade and they get the good grade. And you become bitter, maybe. Children with their parents. Maybe you feel like your mom and dad don't spend enough time with you. They're out working too much. They're doing ministry too much. They're out at church too much. Or maybe you feel that they favor your hu- sorry, your, your parents favor your brother or your sister more than you. And you can become bitter. Blame them for the pain that you feel of being unloved. Believers to God, how many times have we blamed God for the difficulties in our lives? If God really loved me, why would he allow this situation to happen in my life? This pain that I feel, I don't say it out loud, but I feel like he's abandoned me to some degree. He doesn't care about me as much. But all these are different ways we can blame others. There's a problem with this bitterness and blame game. The problem is that bitterness blocks us from hearing the voice of God. And it blocks us from seeking him. As we see in David and his men, or sorry, in David's men only. They didn't seek God in that situation. They only blamed David. Did they ever stop to think, okay, why are there no dead bodies here if our families are gone? See, they are not seeing the truth. They're not hearing from God to hear the solution. Because it says in the scripture that we read today that all of them were carried away, but none were hurt. So there are no dead bodies anywhere. But we're going to look at the second response. First response was bitterness to pain. Now the second response is what David did. But David strengthened himself in the Lord. David wasn't blinded by bitterness. If he was, his story would have ended here. He would have been stoned to death. He wouldn't have recovered his possessions and his wives and families. He wouldn't have heard from God to go after the Amalekites. You see, that bitterness would have blocked him. We can't become bitter in that way, but we have to, in that painful situation, turn our ear to God to hear what he's saying to us. Don't ever turn your ears away from him, your eyes away from him, because maybe he has a solution for you. That's what happened to David. In the beginning, I asked you the question, have we allowed pain to take us off the wrong, the right track? What do you do when life sucks the strength out of you and you have no strength left? What do you do? You know, it's quite simple. It just says here, David strengthened himself in the Lord. And that's what we need to do in our pain. Don't turn your gaze away from God, but turn, turn it towards him. Like, stop looking at the pain only. But turn your gaze to God and listen to him. I believe in Ziklag, David, for this year and four months, had partially just turned his face away from God, kind of like Jonah. Jonah ran the other way from the call of God. David ran the other way and came into the Philistine territory and was ready to fight against his brothers. But God didn't allow, allow him to do that. You know what I see in this entire picture? Through every season, 
We see that God. I'm sorry. Maybe I have to interpret these hieroglyphics for you. God is faithful. That's an A. Sorry. God is faithful. We see that in every season God is faithful and didn't allow him to fall away. God didn't allow him to fight against his brothers. God didn't allow him to die in the wilderness. God didn't allow a jackal or a, I don't know what lives there, a hyena or some wild animal to eat him. God kept him and he was faithful. And God didn't leave him here in the season of victory. He wouldn't have become king if he were here. Do you guys see that? But God was faithful to take him through a season of death to himself. God was saying, I've called you to be a man after my own heart. But then I'm going to create that in you as well so that you can fulfill what I've said in your life. That's the faithfulness of God for you and me. God is good. Just me being here. God is good. I have a couple of stories for you. Times when I had no strength in my life, okay? I don't even remember what the situation was because this was nearly 15 years ago. But there was a time when I had no strength that I felt to seek God, to read my Bible or to pray. (laughs) When you're in pain, I think your initial response might be to cover up that pain with Netflix, Netflix and binge eating. <laughs> Some ice cream, Hagen dazs coffee. Oh <laughs> and we tend to neglect those disciplines that we need in our lives. And that's where I was. God gave me a dream. And when I was in that state, I was running into a deep, dark labyrinth, going deeper and deeper. But then Pastor Joseph was chasing after me. (laughs) And then the scene changed to one that is bright, peaceful, and calm. Pastor Joanne's face appears before me. (laughs) She says to me, Maybe you should read 10 chapters of the Bible per day. I didn't have to interpret that. I didn't have to be like 10 equals something, minus 15, negative 5. No, God was telling me to read your Bible. He was telling me when life leaves you with no more strength left, Find new strength in me. Find new strength in me. It's so simple, but it's what we have to do. Find new strength in God. Like, don't turn your face towards the pain in the misery because we have suffering. But turn your face to God and find new strength. Amen. Amen. There's another moment in my life where I was depressed, facing some sort of emotional challenge, and I just felt like I had no more strength to seek God. So I lied there on the ground in my room, not on the street, in my room, and I fell asleep. And I had... I think I went into a deep sleep because I started to see angels above me. This was the one and only time I saw those angels so clearly. And one of the angels approached me and told me, pray in tongues for it is the wellspring of life. Pray in tongues for it is the wellspring of life. 
in my emotional distress, when I had no more strength left, God was telling me to find new strength in him, to turn my face towards him and away from the pain and struggle. He was telling me to pray, to read my Bible, seek him, because that is where you find your new strength. In those times, don't let go of those things. My third story. I know many of us are called into ministry here. The thing about ministry is when we say yes to God, we go through the season of death. The very yes will be tested and you'll die to yourself. It's difficult. And at one point I said, I don't want to do this. Ministry is too hard. I entertained the idea of what it would look like to go somewhere else. I didn't make any plans. But God gave me another dream. In this dream, I did move away, far away, to a large mansion. But in that mansion, there were no furnishings. It was empty, dull, and void of, of life. I woke up and understood what God was talking to me about. That yes, I could run away. I could live somewhere else in the Philippines or Hawaii, I don't know. In the tropics, I could live somewhere with a nice big house. But then it would be dull, empty, and void of the call of God over my life. It would be void of the plan of God over my life. I would be running the opposite way. What I want to tell you is this. Pain with God is exactly where we need to be. It's better than a thousand elsewhere. Suffering in the plan of God is better than the riches of this world. To live in a great big mansion, I'd rather have nothing and be in the plan of God for my life right in the middle of that pain and suffering and trial. God's been faithful to me. He's kept me through every season. God's kept me. He's held my hand and led me, and he didn't let me run away. He didn't let me quit. He didn't let me fall into temptation. He's been faithful to me. He was faithful to David, as you can see. And he is faithful to you. He won't let you fall away because he is faithful. He won't let you quit because he is faithful. He will take you to where he told you you would go. I don't know what the plan of God is for your life, but I know that it's intricately woven for your enjoyment and fulfillment on this earth for his glory. So what do we do when we have no more strength? We find new strength in God. We turn our face to him and away from the pain, amen? amen. Work might leave you with no strength. Your job, the stress of it all, Find new strength in God. School might leave you with no more strength left, cramming for those essays and finals and tests. Thank God I'm not there anymore. <laughs> when school leaves you with no more strength left, find new strength in God. Can I say a word to you students? 
<laughs> Don't let your studies take you away from your involvement in church. What I want to say is practice those values that you want to have for the rest of your life. Practice them now because you might feel busy now, but then soon you'll get married, you'll have kids, you'll have a job, a career, and you just stay busy. Keep the value that you want to have. Do it now, amen? Keep the Sabbath Serve the church with your gifts. Amen. Marriage can definitely suck the strength out of you. I didn't mean anything by that. I don't know how you're taking it. Can I get a hallelujah? <laughs> Marriage. Let's talk about marriage. Marriage can suck the patience out of you. It can take all the goodness of mankind out of you. And honestly, in those moments, you feel hopeless. You feel like this marriage is pointless. When marriage leaves you with no more strength, find new strength in God. Can I just say, marriage requires two dead people for it to be enjoyable. Two dead people. If one person is still trying to hold on to, I'm right, I'm the boss, or, well, the hu husband is the head, don't get me wrong, but you know what I'm saying. If you're trying to hold on to all your pride, then that will just keep on clashing, but it requires two dead people. And until then, finally when you two die, you'll feel that satisfaction and fulfillment in your marriage. And Amen, it'll get there if it's not there. Amen. Parenting, raising children can leave you with no more strength left. I've been there. At one point, I had three boys in diapers. 4 a.m. in the morning, I'd be drinking a monster. <laughs> when parenting leaves you with no more strength left, find new strength in God. Amen? A word to you, young parents. Don't let raising children take you away from your involvement in church. Out of the ministry that you were serving in before. I know it can be tough physically and mentally. And I know it takes wisdom and strength. But I believe that there's a way that you can continue to serve what you were doing before. Don't let parenting take you away keep those values amen? amen i for yuri and i we've had it requires sacrifice one person is watching the kids and the other is out ministering and let me tell you both are worship and a sacrifice unto god Watching those kids to allow your wife or your husband to minister, that's a worship and a sacrifice, a sweet fragrance unto God. Amen. In ministry, we can run out of strength or, and say maybe we feel burnt out or something. But in those moments, I believe we need to find new strength, new strength in God to accomplish all that he has for us. Or maybe you're an intercessor, you've been in spiritual warfare, and it just tires you out. That kind of stuff is going to tire you out. 
And when you have no more strength left, find new strength in God. Amen. So I am closing up here. I hope you understand what I'm saying here. David went through the process in his most trying moment. David strengthened himself in the Lord. He found new strength when life didn't leave him with any strength left. And that's what we need to do in response to pain and suffering and, and the trial.